Sorry that it cut out again. Hopefully that's the last time tonight. Uh, there then chapter 21, verse 19. Then they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord in Shiloh yearly. And as I was mentioning, there are seven feasts of the Lord that God had prescribed. Three of those, the, all the men of Israel were supposed to go up to the house of God in Shiloh three times per year to present themselves. Well now, in their religion, they've changed this where they don't have three, three of the year uh, you know where the men appear but now it's just once a year and when you look at the details of verse 19 it looks like most people don't even know about this thing because they said behold there's a feast of the Lord in Shiloh yearly in a place and it has to describe where it is what's well, on the north side of Bethel on the east side of the highway they goeth up from Bethel to Shechem and on the south of Lebanon they don't even know where they have to give directions they have to give directions to the house of the Lord why? Because they're going to their own. They're going to the tribe of Dan. They're going to those houses. Or they're going to Mizpah. They're not going to the house of God. They need directions on how to get there. And they're not having their three annual feasts where the men appear before God. They're going. Now notice what they do here um, in verse 21. It says, And see, and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance and dances, then come ye out of the vineyards and catch you every man his wife of the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. So their great plan for restoring the nation of the tribe of Benjamin is that they will get wives from these women from Shiloh who are going to come out and dance. So really they're going to steal wives or steal girls from, from the people of Shiloh, from the men of Shiloh in order to build up the tribe of Benjamin. This certainly isn't God's way of doing things. But notice it says there, for this yearly feast in Shiloh that they can barely find. They don't know where it is. Well, when they find it, there are these women that come out and dance and dances. Well, what's that all about? The men are, according to the God's law, the men are supposed to appear before the Lord at these feasts. There's nothing about women doing these dances. In fact, it reminds me of Exodus chapter 32, where when Moses is up on Mount Sinai from God, the people are tired of waiting for him. They says, we don't know what happened to this Moses. Aaron builds a golden calf. They worship that. They say, these be your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. They worship that golden calf. And they start dancing naked to jungle music. I would guess that that's exactly what's happening here. You've got women doing these dances. Probably dancing naked to jungle music would be my guess. That's probably why they picked out this plan. They figure, oh, we can get me to... Get you, you, know, you could spot out you know who are the good looking ones or something I, I have no idea but it's just it's eerily similar to the rebellion of, of Israel in the wilderness in Exodus chapter 32 and they've taken this feast of the Lord they've whittled it down from three feasts a year where the men appear down to one feast a year and it's not the men appearing before the Lord but it's these women doing these dances so that again it just shows you the state of Israel and then finally there and verse 25, it concludes there, And those days no king in Israel, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Notice in chapter 21, there's not a single word from God in this chapter. If you read it on your own, you'll see that even though they go before the Lord, they don't go before him in the prescribed way. They don't go before him where he actually dwells in Shiloh. And they're weeping. They appear to be sincere to man. And they've done this vow, so they look like they're godly people. But there, God doesn't recognize that. He recognizes the heart, and he can see that heart is still wicked, such that he doesn't even answer them. Uh, there's not a king in Israel anymore, meaning God is not their king. They've rejected uh, God as their king. Man does what is right in his own eyes. And this plan, the weeping before the Lord and building an altar and sacrificing on it, uh, you know, they probably, what they did, it's, it's not unlike what you see today. They probably set up that altar and wept before God, supposedly. And then they go out and now Benjamin, through the plan that man has here, Benjamin has wives after they steal them from these dancers there in Shiloh. And they, they would probably say afterwards, you know, well, look how the Lord has prospered the tribe of Benjamin. God has saved the tribe of Benjamin. And they would probably do that, but yet God had nothing to do with it. Isn't that what people today say where they say, the Lord gave me this or the Lord did this. I prayed, I put out that fleece, I got confirmation and the Lord did this. The Lord didn't do that. The Lord isn't operating today that way. And the Lord didn't do 
did restore the tribe of Benjamin in chapter 21. It was man's plan through killing and through uh, stealing women that they uh, they got it. And they probably gave credit to the Lord to that. So that's where the book of Judges ends. And now we got about seven minutes to go through the book of Ruth. So let's start there at Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. So you have there the book that in the time of the judges. And there was a famine in the land. That's part of that first cycle of chastisement. So you have Israel in rebellion. They're doing evil. Uh, you have to keep that frame of reference in mind of the what's going on, the atmosphere there in in Israel when you read the book of Ruth to get an appreciation for what happens here. Israel is in rebellion, so they're being punished by God with this famine in the land. Uh, a certain man in Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem, Judah means house of bread. But there is no bread in, in Bethlehem, Judah. There is no bread in Israel because of their rebellion against God. So you have... Uh, this man and his wife Naomi and their two sons they dwell in Moab they go there and they uh, the two sons marry uh, these women Ophrah and Ruth they're Moabitess and then it comes about where the the men uh, die over the course of time and now you're left with Naomi Ruth and uh, and Orpah uh, Orpah Moab but Ruth chooses to stay to choose the God of Israel. Uh, note there in um, verse 15, well, let's, let's look at verse 12, Ruth chapter 1, verse 12. Naomi says to her, her daughter, Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should have would ye tarry for them till they were grown? So in other words, Naomi is encouraging the two Moabias women to just stay in Moab. Now to go to Israel, but notice, Ruth, and so Orpah does that, but notice Ruth's response. Uh, verse 15, Naomi said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. So she's chosen idolatry. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. That's a great statement, Ruth, because of the condition of Israel. Israel isn't two million people strong at this point. They're not serving the Lord. They're not having all these great blessings from Israel, from, from God. Rather, Israel is cursed. They're under chastisement. There's a famine in the land. Now the famine is over, uh, but they come back, and Ruth chooses, uh, in spite of what's going on in Israel, in spite of their punishment there, Ruth chooses Jehovah God to be her God. And she goes into, into returns into Israel with Naomi. Well, now she goes to glean there in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said, Go, my daughter. So Ruth, and we covered this uh, a couple weeks ago, I believe, in the book of Deuteronomy, there is a law there, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 19-22, is God's law saying that if you have fields and you reap the harvest, you are not to glean your fields and go back and get every last scrap of food, but rather leave those scraps of food for the poor and the, you know, the destitute, the people who need the food. Well, considering that there is just a famine in the land, and considering that Israel is not following God's laws, there aren't that many people who would be following that rule. They'd be taking, they're, they're, they're a bunch of selfish people, they'd be taking all that food for themselves. And so Ruth was acting in faith by saying, you know, she was being a smart person. She was thinking, she's think, she knew the law, and she says, you know, if that's the law that God has given, if I find someone who I can glean from, then that would be a godly man. And maybe that godly man would take care of me. So it's not just her begging for food, but she is looking for a servant of God, a true man to be her spiritual leader there uh, in the nation of Israel. And that's what she's doing there. But we also, hold your place there. I want to go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 25. 
because she's not doing what's really prescribed in the law. Remember that her husband has died, and according to the law, just one chapter over from that law about gleaning, there in chapter Deuteronomy chapter 25, there's another law about what is supposed to happen when a wife who doesn't have a child, Ruth doesn't have a child, doesn't have a, a male son, I should say, when a woman who doesn't have a male son is bereaved of her husband, what she's supposed to do. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no children, the wife of the dead shall not marry without under. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which he beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. And if the man take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. So the law there, really it says, basically what Ruth, if Ruth was going to follow Deuteronomy 25, what she should have done is once she's bereaved of her husband, her and Naomi moved back to Israel, the first thing she should have done is gone to the nearest kinsman and says, you know, I don't have any children by my by my husband. Now it's your responsibility to have a child with me, have a male child. And if he wouldn't do it, then she's supposed to go up and um, go up to the elders of the city. There in verse 8 it says, Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall Show it to that man that will not build up his brother's house. So a curse is to be pronounced upon the man who will not be the kinsman redeemer. <coughs> Excuse me. Who will not fulfill the brother's obligation to bear a male son by that by his uh, brother-in-law's uh, by his brother's wife. There, um, if he doesn't do it, it's up to the woman to go up to the elders and take the shoe off of his foot and spit in his face and say, you know, basically you're cursed for not doing this. Now contrast that in Deuteronomy chapter 25, contrast that to what happens in Ruth chapter 4. This happens a little later in the story after Boaz agrees to marry Ruth. There is a nearer kinsman than Boaz, and so in Ruth chapter 4, he gives him this, uh, gives that nearer kinsman the opportunity to redeem her. In other words, to fulfill Deuteronomy chapter 25. So if you look at Ruth chapter 4 verse 7, it says, Now this manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things. Notice it doesn't say this is God's law. God's law was back in Deuteronomy chapter 25, but they have changed God's law into this custom. Uh, concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman sent unto Boaz, buy it for thee, so he drew off his shoe. So they have taken where God says the obligation for the nearest kinsman is to come into the woman, have a male child. If he doesn't do that, basically he's cursed. He's, the woman spits in his face. Well, now Ruth doesn't have the power to do this. Ruth cannot go up to the elders of the city. She has no voice. And Boaz has to do it. And when Boaz goes up, rather than following God's law, they're following the tradition, which is there's no curse. There's no spitting in the guy's face. It's just he's just sort of, ah, just take off my shoe and, uh, yeah, you buy it for me. This is a sign that you're going to buy it for me. God's law and they've made it into their own tradition. They've formed it into what they want it to be. Not unlike what the Pharisees and Sadducees did in Jesus' day. They followed the traditions of the father, traditions of the elders. This is one of those traditions going against God's law and they've just taken God's law and they've, they've massaged it and made it into a more feel better type of thing and they've uh, made it into something that they like. So Ruth has to, rather than going by Deuteronomy chapter 25, since she doesn't have a voice, she has to go by chapter 4 and hope that by gleaning in a field she finds a godly man who will take care of her and so we're pretty much out of time but basically I wanted to make that point there uh, let's see if there's anything really critical here um, I think that's that's pretty much it 
uh, what ends up happening, um, oh, in chapter 2, let's see, uh, chapter 2, verse 22, I wanted you to see this here. Uh, Ruth had already gone out into the field and the bullet had gleaned. Um, and in Ruth chapter 2, verse 22, Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Uh, Naomi is very protective of Ruth because there is evil in Israel. They are not following God. They are not obeying His commandments. It would be very easy for this woman to end up uh, being uh, taken while she's gleaning the field by another man and raped her. You know, something would happen to her. And so, you know, Naomi says, you know, stay with it. This guy is, it seems like a godly man. He's going to take care of you. You know, stay with uh, Boaz and, and those men, and they'll protect you. Uh, also, notice there in chapter 3, uh, verse 9. Uh, you had Ruth coming to the floor where Boaz was sleeping and really asking, Ruth asked Boaz to be her kinsman redeemer. And there in verse 9, there in chapter 3, verse 9, and Boaz said, Who answered, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy hand, and near a kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And really that is a type there of the remnant in Israel following you know, Boaz the Jesus Christ at this point. And Ruth is a type of that faithful remnant in Israel. At the time of the tribulation period, you're going to have the Antichrist. And the nation of Israel as a whole is going to make a covenant with the Antichrist. And they're going to follow him. But what they really should be doing is following their true Messiah, the true Christ. And um, you know, making a covenant with him, serving him, enduring until the end so that they'll be saved. And the faithful remnant will do that. And that's what Ruth is a picture of. And notice Boaz says, you haven't chosen you know, the young man with the poor rich. You haven't chosen what the Antichrist represents. Rather, you've chosen what Christ represents. The kinsman redeemer. And that's what Christ ends up being. He comes to save the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And he is their kinsman redeemer in that. Taking them out from being that lawful captive in Satan's, in Satan's grasp and redeeming them from Satan. So you have the Ruth and Boaz being a picture of the faithful, the believing remnant of Israel, that little flock, and then Boaz being a picture of, of Jesus Christ uh, being that kinsman redeemer. And then finally, uh, chapter 4, uh, verse 13. Uh, so Boaz, he does fulfill that role of uh, bearing a male child unto Ruth, but it is of the Lord. It says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. So it was a child of the Lord, and then that child ends up being uh, the grandfather of King David, down there in chapter in, um Verse 18, you get the genealogy there. It says, Now these are the generations of Pharaohs. Pharaohs beget Hezron. Hezron beget Amenadab. And Amenadab beget Nashon. Nashon beget Salmon. And Salmon beget Boaz. And Boaz beget Obad. That was the child that Boaz and Ruth had. And Obad beget Jesse. And Jesse beget David. And so the blessing to Boaz, being that kin, the closer kin gives up his opportunity through his selfishness, through his wanting to keep all this inheritance for himself, and that kinsman loses his spiritual inheritance because he could have been, uh, been the great-grandfather of the King David, who will be the co-regent with Jesus Christ.